There was a huge demand for gasoline after Hitler's war. And more oil was discovered with new drilling technology, but demand continued to be greater than supply, and King Saud refused to allow anyone but Americans to pump Saudi oil. After SoCal had struck oil in Bahrain in May of 1932, the, the Saudis had given Southern California a concession to drill and that was handled by a subsidiary of so-called called the California Arabian Standard Oil, CASOC. And Texas Oil bought half of that in 1936, and they hit oil in 1938. In the, on the 31st of January in 1944, the name of the company was changed to Arabian American Oil Company, or Aramco, and FDR went to visit King Saud two weeks later. The Saudi Aramco needed help distributing their oil and they asked Standard New Jersey and Standard New York to help, but these had entered into the Red Line Agreement of 1928 and King Saud was saying no British, no French, and no Dutch Shell, especially if they called themselves Royal Dutch Shell. The Red Line Agreement was supposed to have kept the oil market stable and healthy, but instead it had stifled the petroleum industry by removing any incentive for expansion or competition. And any of the red line signers had been reluctant to sink money into improvements if the profit, profits were to be split equally among them. France had started a national oil company in 1945 under the French flag, and Gulbenkian, Gulbenkian was living in Portugal and was refusing to give up on the red line. And on the 28th of September in 1945, Truman put a U.S. base at Dahrain in Saudi Arabia to protect the Saudis from the British. And when Standard New York and Standard New Jersey joined with Aramco in December of 1946, they argued that antitrust did not apply to foreign ventures and signed an agreement with the Saudis in March of 1947, making the money available that was needed by Aramco to produce Arabian oil. And America did its best to keep King Saud happy. The same day the Aram Aramco deal was signed, President Truman announced his Truman Doctrine, pledging money to help Greece and Turkey and a pipeline to the Mediterranean was started to keep oil coming to America in case the British managed to shut down the Suez Canal, stopping the Arabian tankers from bringing oil to America out of the Persian Gulf, and the British stirred up the Greeks by telling them the Russians were coming. Anglo-Persians signed a 20-year contract to sell Iranian oil in September of 1947 with Standard New York and Standard New Jersey and Aramco declared the Red Line Agreement officially dead in November of 1948 because one of the partners, France, had become Vichy France and their share had been seized by Britain, and Aramco did not think that was fair. Gulbenkian and Dutch Shell blamed America for the end of the Red Line, and Gulbenkian had been doing just fine and owned a Ritz Hotel in Paris, the Ritz Hotel, in Paris, and that's when Dutch Shell tried to move into American standards market. The Iranians briefly kicked out the British in 1951, and the Seven Sisters were sued for violating antitrust for refusing to buy Iran's oil, and Russia sympathized with Iran, but with the McCarthy hearings going on in America in 1952, the Seven Sisters accused anyone wanting to buy Iran's oil of being a puppet of Stalin. The U.S. government did not take the matter on because the oil companies were already involved in civil claims accusing them of bilking millions of dollars out of the Marshall Plan, with British Petroleum named as a non-defendant co-conspirator. So in 1954, the Seven Sisters met in London to strategize. When Ike became president in 1952, the Shah of Iran was being friendly with BP, 
While America was making money selling ships and military supplies to Shah Reza to keep out both the Russians and the British, but the Shah was spending his oil money on lavish Western-style parties while his secret police were going after Islamic terrorists, and the Shah's oil money was causing inflation, and whenever asked to balance his books, the Shah would try to raise the price of Iranian oil. The vital question for Shell is the price of oil, and on this point most oil men are sensitive. For although the cartel arrangements of the 30s are now broken up, the oil giants, or Seven Sisters, still dominate the Western world, all selling petrol emphasis at the same price. Anatomy of Britain by Anthony Sampson, New York, Harper and Row Publishers, 1962, page 436. Parenthesis brackets. This copy has been purchased from the Princeton University bookstore in 1964 and sailed on the Holland American line to England according to a purchase receipt and a laundry receipt, a telegram, and a thank you note on personal stationery left in the book. Close brackets. Arm and Hammer was the wild card in the oil market. And Armin had invited JFK over for Bloody Marys in 1960. And when elected president, JFK, K, JFK sent Armin on a world tour to collect information about what was going on in the world. And when Armin visited Moscow, he spoke Russian with the Soviet leaders, and they welcomed him warmly. Armin's Occidental Petroleum had hit enough oil in California in 1961 to offer to sell it to the state of California, but when he called Pacific Gas and Electric, Armin was told that all the oil for California would be coming from Canada through a new pipeline now being built, and Armin told the city of Los Angeles that he would build a pipeline from his own oil fields to sell to L.A. for less than the Canadians, and Armin's Occidental won the oil contract away from Canada. Oil had been discovered in Libya two years earlier in 1959, although Mussolini had drilled a few shallow wells that went dry and had been abandoned. One trembles to think what difference it might have made to the Axis powers if the Italians had persevered and hit the mother load of oil which lay beneath the Libyan sands. Hammer by Armin Hammer with Neil Linden, New York G.P. Putnam's Sons, 1987, page 333. <clears throat> Libyan oil was a boon because it did not have to be shipped through the Suez Canal with all its political problems, and instead of selling oil directly, Libya opened portions of its oil-rich lands separately in what were called concessions. Dutch Shell and French National came up dry drilling nor near the Algerian border, but Esso drilled on the Egyptian border and struck oil, and Esso had once been Rockefeller's American standard. Armin had been to Libya during his 1961 world tour, and he knew what the Libyans wanted, so Armin traded fertilizer to the Libyans for oil, having bought the largest export company of American fertilizer in the world in preparation for his trip. <coughs> Armin also bought the third largest American sulfur company that had been having trouble with its Canadian asbestos factory, and then he bought other companies to supply potash and the phosphates for his fertilizer venture to Libya, and he also offered to help build a fertilizer factory in Libya itself if the king granted him a concession to drill for oil. In addition to fertilizer, Armin also promised to help them drill for water. And Armin flew over to Libya in a converted A-26 bomber, and he printed his contract on sheepskin tied with ribbons the color of the Libyan flag, and then he took Oxy to Wall Street and sold his first shares of stock in 1964, and was granted the oil concession in Libya in 1966. Armin was given the land that had already been abandoned as worthless by Shell, Amarada, Marathon, Continental, and Mobile. And his first three wells were dry, and it cost a million dollars each to drill. And after nine months in Libya, 
Armin hit oil and developed the largest known oil reserve. And while it was only 10% of the amount of oil being pumped daily in California, it was plenty big enough. He charmed Libya's ruler, King Idris, into giving him concessions in 1966, much to the chagrin of the sisters, and then proceeded to make mammoth strikes. Soon oxy oil was all over Europe. The blue-eyed sheiks, 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 the Canadian oil establishment by Peter Foster, Canada, Collins Publishers, 1979, page 24. Oil was selling at three dollars a barrel, and Armin had found three billion barrels of oil under the Libyan sands, and Esso offered him one hundred thousand dollars in cash for half of Armin's operation with a promise to ship and refine his oil, since Armin had no pipelines or shipping for his wells. And Armin accepted the offer, but the Esso board refused his deal for reasons unknown. The big boss at Esso came back to talk to Armin and brought 17 lawyers and executives with him. And Armin doubled his price and Standard accepted. So Armin threw a big party to celebrate. But then the board refused the deal again and Armin was on his own. Armin went to Steve Bechtel in San Francisco for help. And Bechtel gave him a million and a half dollars in credit to build a port and a pipeline. And Armin borrowed another million and a half and ordered all his machinery from Germany. And when Armin opened the port in Libya six months later, Al Gore Sr. attended the ceremony as a senator and would later join Armin's board. Armin bought a European refining company run by a Frenchman to market his oil. But Armin was prevented from bringing oil into America by an arrangement between the U.S. government and the Seven Sisters. Armin returned to Libya and drilled for water and found it only 250 feet deep in a reservoir that held as much pure spring water as the Nile could deliver for 200 years. And the king of Libya wanted to rename his hometown after Armin but he would be chased out by Momar Qaddafi's Muslims a year and a half later, and Armin would be in danger of not being able to fill his customers' orders for Libyan oil. Armin went to the United Arab Emirates that had been three sheikdoms under British jurisdiction, one of which was Umm al Kawain, Kawain. Um al Kawain, that had a population of 4,000 people living along a 15-mile coastline, and the country extended inland 20 miles, where there was one school and one paved road, and their main export in 1969 was dried fish. There was no hospital, and their water and electricity were available only to the privileged few, and Armin Hammer gave the sheik of Um al Kawain a million dollars for an oil concession, and when people accused Armin of bribing the Um al Kawain government, Armin said that there was no government to bribe. Armin said the money had gone to the sheik who was the sole authority, and the agreement the sheikh signed with Armin's Occidental gave Armin exclusive rights to drill and sell all the oil in its territorial offshore waters, and the agreement was approved by the British, and Armin's wife attended the celebration party where she was asked to eat sheep's eyes, after which Occidental began to drill. The neighboring sheikh decided to extend his territorial waters to include Armin's new wells, and then the British showed up with some gunboats to tell everyone to stop drilling, and then the Shah claimed Armin's wells belonged to Iran and threatened to send his own gunboats over, so Armin went to visit his friend LBJ, after which the Shah ordered several hundred fighter planes from McDonnell Douglas, but he wanted to pay for them with oil. LBJ made a deal with the Shah that Armin could sell the Shah's oil to those European customers cut short by Libya's cutbacks, and the price of Iranian oil went up, and the Shah of Iran was grateful for Armin having forced, forced the oil companies to pay more for Iranian oil. 
Things didn't go as planned because instead of working with Armin, the Shah showed the contract to the Seven Sisters, who struck an even better deal, even though it meant a loss for them. And the Seven Sisters were more interested in revenge than in money, while the Shah was only interested in money. And that would prove to be the Shah, Shah's downfall that would come sooner rather than later. And the book The Blue-Eyed Sheiks quoted the New York Times book review as saying that Armand was, quote, a character so versatile and unbelievable that most writers of topical events fiction would be embarrassed to put him in a novel, close quote. The Blue-Eyed Sheiks, page 23, note. Armin's father had gotten a job in a drugstore on the Bowery in New York where he learned the ingredients of some pharmaceuticals and began manufacturing them himself. And then he opened a drugstore in the middle of the ghetto on Rivington Street and opened two more in Brooklyn and on the Lower West Side, and he called them hammered drugstores. A friend of Armin's father's named De Leon, who always wore an opera cape, signed Armin up as a member of the Communist Party without Armin's permission, and Armin's father left for medical school and sold his drug stores to his clerks and accepted promissory notes from them so they could pay for the stores out of their earnings. As a doctor, Armin's father worked out of his house where he had a small surgery, and he was known to leave money behind with his patients to pay for prescriptions he'd written, as well as keeping a drawer full of unpaid bills. Young Armand would go with his parents' friends, the Cornblatts, to sell farm products at the market in Jersey City. And Mr. Cornblatt would load a wagon with produce and leave the farm at midnight in order to reach the market thirty miles away by dawn, while Armin slept in the back of the wagon. And Armin would spend the day visiting the other sellers and comparing prices, and when the day ended, they would go through the streets of the town offering what had gone unsold at bargain prices. These were the moments when my fascination with business began, and how appropriate that it should have happened in the marketplace, where all the economic laws of trade are laid bare and made obvious for anyone with eyes to see. I was instantly charmed and thrilled by the harmony in business of theory in practice, and I seemed to recognize by instinct the immutable laws of supply and demand, the importance of good products, and the advantage of intelligent salesmanship over dumb optimism. Hammer, page 56. When Armin was 16 years old, he bought a 1910 Hupmobile Roadster with money borrowed from his 20-year-old brother, and Armin paid it back by making candy deliveries for a candy manufacturer, and he applied for medical school in 1917, while the brother who had given him the car loan went to France to serve in a base hospital on the front lines at the Marne. As Armin waited to hear from medical school, he helped his father in the pharmaceutical industry. Between 1918 and 1919, we discovered to our bewilderment that orders for cases of bottled tincture of ginger had risen by some thousandfold. We were getting immense orders from the most improbable places, especially the states of the Deep South and the Midwest, and we were considering making special arrangements to produce and deliver our hugely increased orders. I couldn't imagine what was going on. Finally, to try to get to the bottom of the business, I went to see a customer of ours, a druggist in Richmond, Virginia, whose own orders of tincture of ginger had enormously increased. The man gave me a long, slow, worldly look and said, You really mean to say you don't know anything about this? Even though I felt that I was looking like a fool, I swore my innocence. Come with me, he said, and led me into the back room of his drugstore. There he took out a glass, a bottle of ginger ale, and a quantity of tincture of ginger, and combined the lot with a few ice cubes in a fizzing potion. Here, taste this, he said. I drank and was immediately jolted by the mule kick of a really powerful ginger ale highball. The kick came from the tincture of ginger which was laden with alcohol. I went immediately to our bankers and obtained letters of credit for a million dollars or more. 
Then I checked with the U.S. Department of Commerce to find out which countries were shipping exports of ginger, and I hired agents through Help Wanted ads in the newspapers to go to all those countries of the world from which ginger originated, chiefly India, Nigeria, and Fiji, and buy up all of the future production of ginger there. In this way, Allied Drug and Chemical Laboratories effectively cornered a world monopoly in ginger and consequently in the production of tincture of ginger in the United States. All the major drug houses, which had been sharing in the bonanza, now had to get their supplies from us. The results were astonishing. Our order book became almost unmanageable. We had to install specially special bottling lines at the plant to handle production, and we were shipping out truckloads every day, especially to the dry states of the South. The total workforce at our plant reached nearly 1,500 employees. Quite suddenly I became a very rich young man. It was an extremely complicated exercise every day to balance my checkbook. Some days I was depositing up to $30,000. I hear that legend today has it that I made my first fortune as a bootlegger. Well, I've been called plenty worse things, and they've been untrue, too. Bootlegging was illegal. There was nothing illegal about the tincture of ginger trade, not until the federal government changed the law, anyway. Allied Drug and Chemical was trading in bonded liquor, legally sold with doctors' prescriptions for medicinal medicinal purposes, so my contacts in the trade were very good. Some deft executive footwork was called for when the federal government changed the regulations governing the sale of tincture of ginger to scotch, forgive the pun, our lucrative trade. The new rules required that alcohol, which was the main ingredient of the product, to be denatured, which meant making it unpalatable by the addition of bitter chemicals. The bottom dropped out of the market, as if it had been drilled by a laser. For a short time we tried marketing a hair tonic, fortified with the denatured alcohol, but it failed to find many customers, except among those few who liked to drink hair tonic, and was quickly abandoned. Hammer, page 66 to 71. Armand and his father's pharmaceutical company bought government surplus stocks of drugs and chemicals after the Great War in huge quantities for a good price. And they profited well with the post-war boom, even gaining contracts with the Russian diplomatic mission in New York to sell morphine, cocaine, and chloroform, among other pharmaceuticals, to the Reds, fighting the Whites and the Greens over the future of Mother Russia. No religious feasts or festivals were ever celebrated in our house. There was a synagogue next door, but none of the members of my family ever attended services there. Jewish observances had gradually ebbed out of my family's life by the time I was born, and my parents had, in fact, become members of the Unitarian Church. Hammer, page 55. Armin's father was arrested for manslaughter when the wife of one of the royal Russian exiles died from complications after an abortion, and Armin's father had thought she had the flu that was sweeping the world that July in 1919, and Armin thought that blaming his father was revenge by the exiles for making medicines available to the Reds, and Armin said that one of his father's lawyers was a fool and the other was a hopeless drunk, and that the district attorney was a Catholic and the assistant DA was Roy Cohn's father. The judge was also an ardent red hater, and even though 400 doctors and surgeons signed a petition supporting Armin's father, he was sent to Sing Sing, where he discovered that prison was a good place to help people, and he quickly became the secretary of the Prisoners' Mutual Benefit Association. Armin graduated from medical school in the summer of 1921, while the typhus in Russia was following the famine and Armin applied for an internship in bacteriology and immunology that wouldn't start for six months, so Armin went to Russia to help people suffering from the famine and the disease of war. Armin took tents and cots and medical equipment that he purchased out of his own pocket, and the hospital supplies alone needed a small fleet of trucks to get all of it into Russia. 
Armin put the loaded trucks onto a ship and was seasick all the way to Riga, where he was met by English officials an English official who told him to stay in his cabin until they searched all his stuff and the British detained him for two days. The war with the Whites was devastating the motherland and Armin's father had been born in Russia, so Armin felt called to go there and as a young doctor going into Russia to help with the typhus epidemic when he was a mere 23 years old, Lenin personally thanked him. One third of the doctors who went to Russia with Armand were Jewish, and as a doctor, Armand was able to help people, while in his free time he could look up Russian businesses that owed money to his father's pharmaceutical company, as well as people who had received oil well machinery from his suppliers that had been shipped but not redeemed. Armand would return again later to Russia to help with Chernobyl where he would again be welcomed by the Russians, and he had seen the Soviets wearing ancient Russian hats designed by Trotsky that were, quote, modeled after the headgear of Scythian archers who were, who more than 2,000 years previously had driven back the hosts of Darius, the Persian king of kings. Hammer, page 98. Train travel after the revolution in Russia was free. So people had been leaving their drought and war-stricken fields in hopes of finding food, and they had heard that the new government was going to be distributing it. And Armin took a train out of Moscow in early August of 1921, and by the time they reached Ekaterinburg several days later, four out of five of the 1,000 people on the train had died of starvation or disease. Armin's field hospital was complete with generators, and he could treat hundreds of patients at one time. And Armin also brought with him an ambulance that was painted on the side, American Medical Mission to Moscow. And the equipment and trucks had cost him $100,000. America had a surplus of wheat that year, so Armin told the Ekaterinburg Soviet that he would send a million dollars worth of grain over if they would fill the return ship with Russian goods, and Lenin got wind of this and asked to speak personally with Armand. Lenin had signed the order to execute the Tsar, but the Tsar had signed the order to execute Lenin's brother, and Lenin's new economic policy signed on the 9th of August in 1921 would save the revolution. Lenin gave the Russians permission to buy and sell privately with his NEP, but kept state control of big business and large industries, and Armin called this state socialism that was a step back from the communism the others in Lenin's group wanted. According to Armin, Britain was plagued with foreign appointments awarded to friends and family of the crown rather than to qualified applicants, and a British man named Urquhart had been trying to make a business deal with Lenin, but Urquhart was demanding exorbitant damages from Lenin for contracts made by the Tsar that had been broken. And Lenin would turn Mr. Urquhart away in 1923 when the British fleet occupied the waters around Constantinople to choke off Lenin's NEP from trading with the rest of the free world. To encourage foreign relations, the Russians were offering fabulous buildings for very low rents to Americans, including the building formerly occupied by the former court jewel jewel jeweler, Carl Fabergé. My suite had been occupied not long before by the well-known English financier Leslie Urquhart, whose Russo-Asiatic Corporation had been the greatest foreign enterprise in Tsarist Russia. Its interest included valuable copper mines and other minerals, tracts of timberland, timberland of almost unlimited extent, and mining and oil rights over the richest section of western Siberia. Hammer, page 123. An American named Vanderlip was staying across the hall from Armand and had asked Lenin for concessions to the Kamchatka oil fields in 1919, but his plans fell by the wayside because Lenin wasn't ready for war with Japan, 
and Armin signed his first agreement with Russia on the 28th of October in 1921, after which Armin moved to a different, more modest office. It took until December of 1921 to get Armin's first shipment of grain to Russia since the port of Leningrad was frozen solid, as it was every Russian winter, and so the wheat had to be shipped through Estonia. Russia had always looked longingly towards Constantinople in the south in order to have a warm water port, but a railroad through Afghanistan was their second choice, and the eastern port of Vladivostok was unavailable because it was occupied by the Japanese until 1922. The train carrying Armin's grain was being held up by a station master, asking for some of it to be left there as a toll charge, so Jerzinski ordered the station master shot, and Armin's grain finally arrived. The first person Armin hired to work in his Moscow office was a girl who had lost her parents in the war with the Whites, and she dressed up as a boy and enlisted in the Red Army and fought the entire Russian Civil War without anyone finding out she was female. Armin's grain was the first shipment of wheat into Russia since the revolution began, and after offloading the ship, Armin returned to New York with almost a ton of caviar in fifty-pound wooden kegs along with quantities of Russian leather and fur. The sturgeon in Russia's Caspian Sea could weigh up to thirteen hundred pounds, and they grew over twelve feet long, and each yielded two hundred pounds of caviar that would sell for a couple hundred thousand dollars in New York in the year 2000. The Caspian Sea was called the Khazar Sea or Kazakh Sea from the name of the people of Russian origin who had lived there on the Caspian Sea before moving down into Iran, and the name Kazakh became the name of the Cossacks, originally from the Mongolian word that meant free men. When Armin met with Trotsky and Lenin, they gave him permission to work an asbestos mine, and Lenin told Armin to come see him any time and promised to help in any way he could, and it was not a mere gesture, because Lenin would supply him thereafter with military guards for Armin's business ventures. Armin went around finding work for thousands of Russians, and he leased buildings and ordered machinery and built schools and houses for his workers, and he would personally get the factories up and running. Armin said that Lenin was a friendly man with a twinkle in his eye, but that Trotsky never smiled. And Armin talked to Trotsky in German, but talked to Lenin in English. And Lenin showed Armin a copy of Scientific American magazine and said that Russia needed science and technology. Until Armin arrived, the Russians had been mad at America because they'd bought a million pairs of army boots that were surplus from the Great War, but the boots had paper soles that turned to mush in the Russian snow, so Armin arranged a refund. Armand would call Lenin's office to get stubborn policemen off his back, and the results would be immediate, and Armand would write or cable Lenin's office any time and receive an instant reply. Lenin thought Armand was the son of a millionaire, but Armand was his own millionaire after becoming rich off prohibition, and Armand brought power saws and compressed air drills into Russia, and Armin brought electricity and light bulbs, and Armin brought machines that could crush ore instead of having the peasants do it by ham, hand with small hammers. Armin built many more houses and schools and hospitals, and Armin bought a big load of surplus American army uniforms for his workers to wear. Our exports, in experts, exports, included a great network of fur-gathering stations across huge areas of the Urals and Siberia, and conducted a trade which was like the old days of the West and the Hudson's Bay Company. Hammer, page 160. The Russians started getting nervous about all the furs leaving the country, and told Armin to start doing something else, and Russia needed pencils desperately, so Armin agreed to try making pencils and he went to Germany and found some pencil makers willing to move to Russia. 
And while the pencil makers had kept their pencil making skills secret for hundreds of years, the Great War had broken their loyalty to the fatherland, and Armin promised the Germans nice homes and schools for their children in Russia, and even promised to keep them supplied with German beer, but the pencil makers found out that they liked Russian beer just as well. Armin's factory soon made enough pencils for all of Russia and was able to export them to the rest of the world, and every pencil had the name of Armin Hammer stamped on it. Armin gifted Lenin with a paperweight of a monkey sitting on a pile of books staring at a human skull held in his hand, and one of the books the monkey sat on was Darwin's Origin of Species, and Lenin liked the paperwork paperweight so much that he ordered it to stay on his desk forever, and it's still there in the Kremlin's National Museum. Lenin suffered a stroke in the winter of 1922 that paralyzed his right arm and leg, and he had to learn how to write with his left hand, and Lenin suffered another stroke and died on the 21st of January in 1924, and his associates waved away the artillery carriage with six black horses so they could carry his body themselves for almost six miles through the cold Russian streets. And for the next three days, almost a million people came to walk past Lenin lying in state while the lines stretched for miles and wood fires burned alongside the road to keep the mourners warm. Armin moved in 1924 to the mansion house where the director of Hoover's Relief Administration had lived, and Armin asked his brother to come to Russia to help search for Tsarist treasures, and Armin and his brother shopped all over the country at flea markets to buy up old stuff left over from the imperial days of the Tsar. Furniture was being used as scrap lumber or firewood, and paintings were stripped off their frames to use the canvas for filling chinks in drafty rooms, and tableware was split up and serving board bowls were used as chamber pots. And at one hotel the manager complained that the dishes previously used by the Tsar broke too easily, so he traded the whole set to Armand for a new one, and the old unwanted set was centuries old. Armin also bought a wine service from the Hotel for Pennies that had a royal coat of arms done in gold and enamel sealed between two layers of glass, and the glassmaker had taken the secret of his work to his grave. Russia needed tractors, so Armin went to America and had lunch with Henry Ford, and Armin had taken the train to Detroit all by himself, and before the Great War, Armin's uncle had franchised a Ford agency in southern Russia, and Ford had received a suspicious package from Russia, and Ford called in the bomb squad. And when they carefully peeled back the wrapping, they found an Easter cake sent by Armin's uncle, and Ford liked the cake so much that he took a piece to work with him every day and refused to let anyone else have a share. Armin wanted to buy tractors, but Ford wanted to sell cars to Russia instead. And Armin told him that Russia had no roads, but Ford insisted that if they had cars, Russia would build the roads. And Armin said cars were a luxury, and Ford said they were a necessity. And Armin asked for a million tractors, but Ford said his company lost money building tractors. Armand explained that Russia was trying to jump from the Middle Ages into the modern world, and Ford said that's exactly what they should do. Armand couldn't find any banks willing to lend him money to buy more businesses to help Russia in 1929. So he sold his pencil factory to the Russian government, and the Soviets made payments to Armand for a year and a half, never missing a payment. And by 1930, Armin's factory was making a half million pencils every day. The banks outside the motherland wouldn't lend money to Russia because Stalin was behaving badly and nobody knew how to do business with him. And all the imported tractors from many different countries were being sent to the collective farms instead of to private farmers. And when Armin left Russia in the fall of 1930, he had spent nine years in the motherland, and Stalin took his name off their pencils and named them after Sacco and Vanzetti. 
The following year, the workers stopped oiling the machinery, and a machine that had made the lead part of the pencils exploded and killed a large number of the workers, and Stalin took the Statue of Liberty off Armin's catalog cover. Stalin wanted to make communism work without Lenin's new economic policy that had meant doing business with capitalists, and Lenin had especially wanted Russia to do business with America, with the NEP, while Trotsky wanted the rest of the world to immediately join in the communist revolution, and Trotsky forgot that America had already had a successful revolution of their own. Lenin's NEP had made good start goods start magically appearing for s sale on store shelves. Lenin's NEP had made goods start magically appearing for sale on store shelves, but the worst of these three leaders won out because the British Empire had continued to cast an isolationist pall over the Russia, over Russia, and the motherland would remain closed off after Lenin's death for the next seventy years. Armin left Russia having never met Stalin. Stalin himself once even confided to me his own unhappiness with Beria's influence. Before Beria arrived, dinner meetings used to be relaxed, productive affairs. Now he's always challenging people to drinking contests, and people are getting drunk all over the place. Khrushchev remembers, page 101. Stalin was crazy with rage, yelling at Ignatiev and threatening him, demanding that he throw the doctors in chains, beat them to a pulp, and grind them into powder. It was no surprise when almost all the doctors confessed to their crimes. I can't blame them for slandering themselves. Too many people have passed before me, different sorts of people, honest men and traitors, men of the revolution and saboteurs, all of whom confessed. For example, take Meritskoff. Meretzkoff. He's now nearing the end of his life. He walks around crippled, almost bent in two. He admitted he was an English spy. Khrushchev remembers, page 287. Armand arrived back in America in time for the repeal of Prohibition, where beer brewers were struggling to meet the demand, and there were no barrels to hold the beer, because all the barrel makers had gone out of business as Prohibition had dragged on and there were no oak staves left to make barrels, and the new ones had to dry for two years before being used in new barrels. Armin found out that Russia was making staves, that they were exporting to Germany, so Armin called Russia. The Germans were grumbling that Russia had raised the price, and Anheuser-Busch gave Armin a check for $100,000 to buy 10,000 barrels for making their beer and other brewers called Armand, asking for barrels, so Armand made a million dollars in the next few years, and he employed the unemployed in his new cooperage factory that would stay in business until the invention of aluminum barrels put the factory out of business at the end of the 30s. The New Deal was subsidizing farmers, and warehouses were filled with a glut of potatoes that were going unsold, so Armin bought them up in order to start making alcohol, using a good recipe he'd brought back from the motherland for serious Russian vodka. I went to the offices of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation in Boston and asked the official in charge of the New Market Rum Plant how much he wanted for it. He said $55,000, the amount of the bad debt for which they had re repossessed the distillery. I whipped out my checkbook and wrote a check. Well, Dr. Hammer, he said, you're now the owner of a distillery. It's a good thing you acted so promptly, because only yesterday Mr. Joseph Kennedy was in here expressing an interest in this plant. He asked if we would put it on hold for him, and we asked for a deposit. He said that he would be in today with a deposit. You've just beaten him to it. Hammer, page 254 and 5. Armand hired a German chemist named Hans Meister from American Distilleries and gave him permission to hire his own staff, and Armin began making gold coin booze and would own nine other distilleries by the end of Hitler's war. Armor call, Armin called one brand the crown jewel of Kentucky bourbon that had a crown stamped on the bottle 
and Armin went on a publicity tour for his brand of bourbon, wearing an old Habsburg crown that he had found in his travels, and it even had some of its jewels left. And Armin used the advertising tour to help charities where local donators could be photographed wearing the Habsburg crown. The IRS took Armin to court over whiskey taxes in 1938, and FDR's wife took the stand in Armin's defense. And when he won the case, Armin sent FDR a Fabergé ship model of a Volga steamboat that had a music box inside and had been made in 1913 to commemorate the 300th anniversary of the Romanov dynasty and had been given as a present to the Tsar's hemophiliac son. FDR held a special ceremony to receive the gift and invited the first Soviet ambassador to the U.S. to attend, and when FDR opened the gift box and punched the music button, it filled the Oval Office with God Save the Tsar. Armin moved to California in 1955 to retire, but he quickly became bored, and a friend suggested he try some oil tax shelters, which meant that Oil well diggers were allowed to write off their dry wells from their taxes, and s as soon as a driller hit oil, it was time to find another dry well. Armin's friend said he knew of a small California company called Occidental Petroleum that had 600,000 outstanding shares listed on the exchange at 18 cents a share and the friend said they could issue an additional 600,000 shares to Armin at 20 cents each that would give Armin us 50% ownership of the company, and this would give the company $120,000 to keep drilling for oil on their two wells, one in Fresno County and the other in the Bay Area. The company had $14,000 in the bank, and their assets totaled $78,000, including the bank account, and the company's expenses ran to $93,000, so Armin figured that the total worth of Occidental Petroleum was maybe $34,000 and the stock wasn't worth buying, so Armin and his friend lent the company $100,000 instead to keep drilling, and both wells struck oil, and Armin was now in the oil business. <clears throat> Occidental's stock jumped to a dollar a share, and Armin began buying it on the open market until he had a majority ownership, and he was invited to join the board and was elected president and CEO in the summer of 1957, and then a friend called and told Armin that the mutual broadcasting system was for sale because MBS was desperate since people were watching television instead of listening to the radio. The mutual broadcasting system was sending their programs to radio stations over telephone lines and their phone bills were running into the millions of dollars and the current president had been giving advertisers a cut rate deal if they gave him a personal bonus. So Armin called a meeting of the board in his office without inviting the president and he looked into the president's desk found enough evidence to offer him the choice of either resigning or going to jail, and the president resigned. Armin changed MBS's programming to appeal to people while they were driving their cars and to housewives as they cleaned their houses, and he sold the company in 1958 for a profit of $1,300,000. Television was now bringing the world into people's living rooms, so tourists had stopped visiting Europe as they had been in the 50s. And to make up the revenue shortfall, Britain was clear-cutting trees across Canada for wood products, pulp products, paper and timber, while Russia's vast forests were being protected by the Great Cold War, and Russian oil from Baku was still being boycotted because they were communists. General Motors was the largest corporation in the world in the 60s, followed by Rockefeller's Standard Oil and Royal Dutch Shell was number three, and the British government owned 56% of Royal Shell's stock. Ford was the fourth largest corporation and General Electric came next, then a British company called Unilever followed by U.S. Steel as number seven, and then came Mobil Oil and then Chrysler and Texaco. 
German corporations were still cleaning up the rubble, and the French were still fighting among themselves, and the Italians were being Italians, while the Russians and the Chinese were busy with their social experiments. Companies were engaged in what they called regionalizing by setting up shop in different countries and hiring locals, then becoming involved in their communities. And the trick in the 60s was to win jurisdiction over enforcing corporate law in these foreign countries, many of them crippled by Islamic terrorism and other acts of barbarism, barbarian backward tribal society societies. Islamic terrorism and other acts of barbarian backward tribal societies. <clears throat> the Russians had stayed in Azerbaijan, north of Iran, to keep an eye on the rebellious radical Muslims in Iran who were following an anti-Western zealot named Mossadegh, who wanted to get rid of the Shah. And Mossadegh wanted to put an end to the British owning a majority share in the Anglo-Iranian oil company, and Mossadegh wanted to do this by nationalizing Iran's oil. Time magazine made Mossadegh the man of the year in 1951, and the Muslims were rioting that summer in approval of Mossadegh, and so the Shah made him prime minister to placate them, and as Mossadegh moved towards nationalizing Iran's oil, the British pulled all their workers out of the oil fields, and the Seven Sisters bought Arab oil instead of buying from Iran. Mosaddegh had taken his cue from Mexico, having nationalized their oil without <clears throat> Mosaddegh had taken his cue from Mexico, having nationalized their oil without the Americans invading Mexico, and Mexico had taken direction from the British, having nationalized their coal and steel industries after Hitler's war. There would be a glut in the oil market in 1951 as the Saudis increased production to make up for the loss of Iranian oil, and bringing Iran back online would lower prices further and force the Saudis to cut back production, and the Muslim rioters had wanted to nationalize oil in Iran for the sake of Islam, not for the sake of Iran, and the Shah had been powerless to stop them. To Mossadegh, the Americans were cowards who would not dare interfere with the nationalization of Iranian oil. And because Mossadegh did not want an Islamic state with its Sharia law, it was easy for the British to drum up hatred against him among Muslims. And the Mossadegh, and Mossadegh lost support from his Muslim followers when the Persian BBC claimed Mossadegh was selling out to the Russians, which was not true. But the BBC was believed because all the Iranians knew that Mossadegh was against having an actual Islamic state. The British had asked Truman to help them with a coup against Mossadegh because Mossadegh had actually asked the Russians for help in kicking out the British, and Truman just said no to participating in a coup against Mossadegh because he saw it as a British problem, and Truman also knew that Mossadegh was anti-communists anti -communist, and would not have given Iran to Russia, which was seen as a good thing in America. Truman was actually advising Mossadegh on how to put an end to Anglo-Iranian and had been given, giving him directions on how to start a new company that would cooperate better with the Seven Sisters. And when Truman left office in January of 1953 and Ike became president, Churchill reminded Ike that the British SAS were among the American soldiers fighting in Korea, and instead of helping the British with their coup against Mossadegh, Ike started talking with the Shah, and Ike quickly took command of the problem in Iran. Mossadegh was 80 years old, and Ike thought the Mossadegh problem wouldn't last much longer, that when Mossadegh died of natural causes, the Shah would naturally regain control of his government, but the British were insisting on spearheading a coup against Mossadegh. The plan was to get the Shah to ask the British for help, since Truman had turned him down.
and British agents and the Persian BBC were stirring up the Moslems to riot again, and getting them riled up was not at all difficult, because the British had pulled out of the oil fields in 1951, and tens of thousands of, Ira of Iranians had lost their jobs and had nothing better to do than to cause trouble for the government. The Shah had been losing money at an alarming rate at, as the British boycotted Iranian oil and had blockaded the port, ports to stop any oil shipments, and the Iranians, who were suffering from the bad economy, were eager to join in the rioting. Muslims in general hated the British because of the betrayal of Lawrence of Arabia after the Great War, and to them, nationalizing the oil in Iran was a sure way to get back at them. And Russia had more than its share of Muslims and knew that if Islamic terrorism was allowed to succeed in Iran, there would be no stopping it anywhere. The British were threatening to send the army into Iran, but Truman told them not to, and Ike told the CIA to go ahead with a plan to give power back to the Shah, telling them that the Shah should oust Mossadegh by decree. But Ike attached a condition to that plan, and that was for the British to lose their monopoly on the Anglo-Iranian oil company with its non-audited profits. And in addition, the Anglo-Iranian must, ang the Anglo-Iranian must cooperate with the Seven Sisters instead of conti continuing to do business behind their backs. Instead of cooperating with the British coup, the Americans began organizing Iranian leaders to take over from Mossadegh when the Shah issued his decree, and the several hundred people cooperating with the Americans were betrayed to Mossadegh, who had them all arrested and murdered. The Russians were eager to stop Islamic terrorism themselves because the British were failing to do it, preferring instead to use rioting Muslims for political purposes. And while some had hoped that removing Mossadegh would restore stability to Iran, for the British army, the failure to stop the riots was a sure way to be invited back into the country. When the people who'd been cooperating with the Americans were murdered, Ike ordered the CIA back to America because Mossadegh's days were numbered anyway, but the CIA disobeyed Ike and managed to get Mossadegh arrested in December of 1953 and locked up in jail for three years. And Alan Dulles flew the Shah back into Iran from where he had been waiting out the coup. Mossadegh would die in 1967 in his home at the age of 84 while under house detention, and the U.S. had throttled back on the antitrust cases against the Seven Sisters to get them on board in supporting the Shah, encouraging them to allow Iran back into the oil market, and when the Americans took the coup away from the British, the Shah was very impressed and would cooperate only with America thereafter, so the British newspapers began a drumbeat of criticism against what they called American imperialism. When President Eisenhower sent Kermit Roosevelt into Iran to help topple Mossadegh, it was with the thought that if America pulled Anglo Iranian out of the fire, Anglo Iranian would have to let some American companies into Iran. For Iran's pride, the principle of nationalization had to be maintained, so ownership of the country's oil fields was turned over to the National Iranian Oil Company, formed a couple of years before, in anticipation of this upshot. Naturally, it was also agreed that Iran would get the now standard 50-50 split of profits, but to operate the industry for NIOC, Hoover insisted upon a consortium of members of the Seven Sisters Cartel. These companies were British Petroleum, the new laundered name of Anglo-Iranian, which got 40% of the action, Royal Dutch Shell 14%, Compagnie Francois Des Petroles, 6%, Exxon, 7%, Gulf Oil, 7%, Mobile Oil, 7%, Standard Oil of California, 7%, Texaco, 7%. Many smaller companies got the remaining 5%. The ironic net effect of Mossadegh's nationalization was to turn a good share of Iranian oil production over to American firms.
quote, we kept it from falling back into British hands, close quote, an American embassy official candidly explained to me. Fall of the Peacock Throne, page 223. The British had used the Sultan of Oman to sabotage Iran in 1953 and then to thwart the Saudis in the 50s. And there had been ten oases in Saudi Arabia, seven held by Abu Dhabi and the other three by Oman, and the Saudis wanted to trade these oases for a slice of the desert between Abu Dhabi and Qatar that would give them access to the Persian Gulf. A conference between the powers was called in the summer at Geneva in 1955, and Khrushchev's report was that Britain and France wanted to reunite East and West Germany, and they planned to take over control of the Near East that had always been in Russia's backyard, and Khrushchev said that the Iron Curtain did not prevent Westerners from visiting Russia, but that the West was refusing to allow Westerners to visit Russia. The British had gifted the Middle East with permission to buy military equipment to kill Jews, and Britain had sold their lend surplus to Islamists after Hitler's war, and after 30 years of gun sales, the Egyptians spearheaded an attack against the State of Israel in 1956, and historians took sides depending on their stake in the e economic success of Britain. On October 29, 1956, Israeli troops had suddenly attacked Egypt and rapidly neared the Suez Canal. Almost immediately, Britain and France, still smarting over Nasser's seizure of the canal in July, in abrogation of an agreement which would have given him control over it by 1968, and irritated at United States Secretary of State Dulles' refusal to take the sort of line with Nasser which they felt necessary, bombarded Egyptian bases and landed troops near the the canal. The USSS immediately demanded international action to stop the Israeli and Western invasion of Egypt, 20th century Russia, Treadgold, page 484. Ike told France and Britain to get out of Egypt, and they immediately complied and more trouble would break out in Syria and Lebanon in 1958, and Britain defended Kuwait against the Iraqis in 1961, and two decades after Europe had ignored Jews being scapegoated by Nazis, Europe turned its back on the state of Israel in 1967, and Israel had to fight alone against an enemy with over twice as many tanks and planes and armed fighters. The Israelis won, wonder of wonders, and they won back the desert, and they won back the Gaza Strip, and they won back the Golan Heights, and they even won back the old city of Jerusalem. After many years, during which the Jews had not been permitted to go to the West Wall, a deeply moving prayer was held beside the wall. In their hearts, all members of the Jewish people were present there to celebrate the historic event. Even though Bethlehem and Hebron fell into the hands of the IDF and fighting on the West Bank ended, all the happenings that day were placed in the shade by the liberation of the Western Wall and the Old City. The conquest was very costly in casualties because of orders forbidding IDF soldiers to use heavy weapons which could damage the holy place of Christians, Muslims, or Jews. Israel, years of crisis, years of hope by Roman Frister, New York, McGraw-Hill Book Company, 1973, page 171. Thousands of individual volunteers came to Israel to help out with the fighting, and then with the rebuilding, and many of them stayed, and Golda Meir went to America to talk with President Nixon. Egypt and Syria invaded Israel again on the 8th of October in 1972 and turned the Olympic Games in Germany into a war zone. And Syria had been one of the places to which Nazis fleeing the fall of the Third Reich had escaped through the Odessa, Odessa rat line, as well as to Argentina and Chile, although many had found refuge in Egypt where the British had been deeply established for a very long time and had created an upper ruling class. Churchill had been told to build an air base in Egypt after the Great War, and he'd been given the title of the Asiatic Viceroy. 
and after Hitler's war, an American named Bob Clyerhugh was sent to Baghdad and was immediately accepted into the British country club that his family would use every day, and his daughter was allowed to ride with the hunt where they chased a little animal called a wahi that looked like a coyote. I think at this time it would be meaningful for me to explain what my military duties were in Iraq. I was the program director for the military assistance group. Our first task was to decide the size of the military force. Now my job was to determine the number of tanks, artillery rep weapons, vehicles, and supporting equipment that was needed to accomplish such an assignment. We put together a program that included all types of combat equipment together with the communications and other support equipment that would allow the Iraqi troops to accomplish these assigned missions, A Journey Through Memory, by Robert W. Clyerhugh, San Francisco, Robert W. Clyerhugh, 1995, page 128. One day Bob took his family to a new restaurant. Then the fanfare and a must for any en entertainment in the Middle East, a belly dancer. Most belly dancers were Egyptian and rather fat. This turned out to be a young, slim, and very attractive young girl. As we watched her perform the usual gyrations, I looked at my dadder my daughter Joan, and she was crying. I said immediately, Joan, what is the matter? Joan replied, Daddy, I can't tell you. I said, Joan, for heaven's sakes, I'm your father, and it is my job to understand and help. After a little coaxing, Joan blurted out, Daddy, I know her. A Journey Through Memory, page 69. While the British had made themselves comfortable in Egypt, they had invited Egyptians into British schools, and British and Egyptian children had grown up together and belonged to the same sporting and yacht clubs, and the British believed that the Americans needed oil too badly to be willing to help the state of Israel survive. When the Balfour Declaration gave the Zionists permission not to be shot by the British military, and Jewish civilians were moving back into the Holy Land, Palestinian Arabs were told by Viceroy Churchill to run away and hide until the Jew communists were destroyed, and then the Palestinians could come back to their homes and British journalists working for the BBC became ever-present in the Holy Land for the next 70 years, working up horror stories about homeless Palestinians as BBC journalists walked freely among them, and if nothing bad happened, they would make something up. The Arabs had tried an oil embargo after the 1967 Israeli war, but their effort failed from fighting amongst themselves over who should be the next Islamic ruler when the great Mahdi appeared, the Sunnis or the Shiites, and the Saudis owned the Sunni holy places while Iran was the leader of the Shiites, and Turkey had once been the chief of the Muslim world ever since the fall of Constantinople, but had lost their head when Turkey was defeated in the Great War in 1918. Iraq had been given to Britain in April of 1920 by the League of Nations as a mandate and had been given nominal independence in October of 1932. And Iraqis started claiming that Palestine belonged to Iraq, but most Muslims thought no government at all should exist, just a local imam in every neighborhood dispensing Sharia law, and the Muslim men held tightly to their belief that when the great Mahdi came back, he would kill off all the women, and the Mahdi would make it possible for men to bear children. Islamists fought the Western world with everything they had to prevent women from gaining any power, and while they called the state of Israel the Little Satan, they called America the Great Satan, and radical Islamic terrorists had been more than willing to enter into an alliance with the British to bring both Satans down. The Arab countries now owned enough guns to defend themselves from their neighbors without any help from the outside world and Britain removed all military forces from the Persian Gulf in the fall of 1967 because they could no longer afford to stay there, and they had to leave Bahrain where many thousands of troops had been stationed to protect British interests, and the British would be completely gone by 1972. When the Americans sided with Israel, 
in the 1967 Six-Day War. Britain hoped the Arabs would pay to have British troops stay in Arabia, instead of asking the Jew-loving Americans for their advice. But the Americans did not send soldiers to the Six-Day War, and the Israelis defended themselves, so there was no cause for the British to invade the Holy Land again. By 1968, Occidental stock was selling for $150 a share, and when it split three for one, Armin's Occidental was grossing almost a billion dollars a year, and instead of merely distributing dividends, Armin bought small countries to complement his operations, and one of them was the Hooker Chemical Company that had buried chemicals from 1941 to 1952 next to their plant in Niagara Falls in New York, and a few years after buying Hooker, Armin would spend $20 million cleaning up Love Canal. In Libya, an Egyptian started a Muslim revolution, and the Libyan king went into exile in Egypt under the protection of Sadat, <clears throat> and the Islamist Qaddafi was a Muslim national socialist de demanding more money for Libya's oil, and in response, Armin stopped work on a refinery in Libya, so Qaddafi cut Armin's production rate in half, and that put Armin in trouble with his customers. <clears throat> So Armin went to New York to talk to Esso Standard and told them that Qaddafi would crack down on all the oil companies if Armin gave in to Qaddafi. Armin told Esso that if Esso would sell enough oil to Armin's customers in place of Libyan oil, then Armin would be able to stand up to Qaddafi, and that would do everyone in the oil business a big favor. Esso made excuses, and the following month, Qaddafi nationalized all the oil in Libya, and Armin had put his life on the line, flying to Libya to protect his shareholders' interests, and for the first time his wife had refused to go with him, because it was simply too dangerous. Armin had stopped in Turin to pick up his French friends, since being a lone Jew in Islamic Libya was not a good idea and Armin chartered a French Falcon in case Qaddafi decided to keep Armin's own Gulf Stream jet. And after a week of meetings, Armin left in the middle of the night without permission from the airport tower, and the Libyans called him the next day and agreed to a 30-cent raise in the price of oil and an 8-percent raise on its 50-percent tax, to which Armin agreed, and then all hell broke loose. Standard of California and Texaco of Texas were not willing to go along with the Seven Sisters and signed with the Libyans as Armand had done, and the oil countries of Iran, Algeria, Kuwait, and Iraq immediately insisted on raising the tax paid by the oil companies, and on the 9th of December in 1970, OPEC met in Venezuela. A long chain of events led up to the OPEC crisis, but perhaps the critical starting point was the year 1960. In that year, Exxon forced down the world price of oil. OPEC was created to oppose these bargain basement prices. It seems more than ironic today that the creation of OPEC was in response to falling prices. Emphasis, theirs. Blue-eyed sheiks, 1979. Armin suggested that the other oil companies, oh, Blue-Eyed Sheiks, page 197. Armin suggested that the oil companies agree to fill customer oil orders for oil whenever Islamic terrorism cut back the supply, disrupting the oil market instead of engaging in fair competition. And Armin's meeting in July of 1971 in New York got them to agree, but then the Seven Sisters started breaking off one after another to sign separate agreements with OPEC, and Armin was advised to buy a bulletproof vest, and then Qaddafi called to say he was sorry. Armin patented a new process for mining shale in Colorado in 1971 by drilling underground caverns and filling them with shale rubble, then setting it on fire. And Armin said the oil flowed as from a well and that it was such high quality that most of it could be used as diesel fuel without fur further refining. 
Armand asked the U.S. government to help him scale up to commercial production, but it was called, quote, alternative energy research, close quote, by the Seven Sisters, and Armand was again turned down, and his shale oil production was put on hold. The wrestling matches in American boardrooms and shareholders' meetings turned the American dream into reality, and Donald Trump became a celebrity after becoming president of his father's company in 1971 and renaming it the Trump Organization. And the Great Cold War brought prosper prosperity to America as the U.S. asked private American companies to bid on contracts instead of projects being run by the government. The competition among these manufacturers kept the American economy healthy, while in Britain there was little choice in awarding contracts since so many industries had been nationalized and goods and services for the British suffered in quality what was not suffered in price. <laughs>